I'm going to invite you to take your copy of God's Word this morning and turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And we're going to look at a, a passage of Scripture that might be unique to, uh, to the message of the cross uh, a little bit. But uh, Peter is preaching about why they are able to have the power to heal uh, this lame man at the temple courts. And, um, and so that's the context of the story, but he says some very powerful things. We're in the middle of a series uh, called the Easter Experience, in which that's just it. We're trying to experience all that Easter is. We know uh, many of us have been ingrained in this culture of Easter, you know, all of our life. We know me- the message of the cross. We know the message of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. We know about the crown of thorns, and we know about the, the beating, and we know about the spitting in the face, and we know about all that, that, went in the, that the Gospels uh, represent uh, of the message of Jesus. We, but if we're not careful, we become calloused to that. We become, it's like, it's like old news to us because we've heard that before. So preacher, tell me something new. Listen, I have nothing new to bring to you today other than the gospel message which Jesus was, was crucified. He was, he was beaten beyond recognition. Listen, he was buried in a borrowed tomb and he was resurrected the third day to conquer death, to conquer hell, to conquer sin on our behalf. Listen, I don't have a new message to bring to you today. I have an old message which we need to understand in a new way and a greater way. And so I, I don't want to disappoint you this morning. You're not going to be uh, probably find any new revelation here this morning when it comes to the text. But what I do hope is you find new revelation when it comes to how it applies to your life. And that is my heart this morning. I've often been captivated by the way the last few hours of Jesus' life went down. You know, the last day, uh, if you will. I remember uh, as a kid seeing uh, different images of Jesus on the cross. Do you ever see those pictures or maybe in your Sunday school lesson or on the flannel graph board that we talked about a few weeks ago? It was displayed for you, depending upon where you were. Are you seen a, a DVD of it, some of you young people, uh, in one of your Sunday school lessons? And, and I remember seeing some of those, and some of those don't really look very graphic. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's like Jesus has this heavenly glory around his head. He doesn't, he's not really smiling, but it kind of almost gives you the feel that it's kind of almost okay that what, what he's experiencing, you know, and, and so different images uh, probably display it different ways, all right, and so, I, but I just can't imagine that it was anything like this. I can't imagine there was anything but like, you know, joy on Jesus' face, really, uh, with, with all that he had gone through on that day. Yes, was he joyful to be able to fulfill God's call in his life and purpose to come and die on behalf of us? Yes, that we, we know that. He willingly came. He willingly laid down his life as a lamb being led to slaughter. We understand all that. But listen, I want you to get this picture in your mind. It's not like, it's not like many of the pictures have displayed. I want you to understand, this was a bloody and a gruesome murder, massacre, if you will. I want you to understand, this is not some, just knock a couple nails in his hand and a couple nails in his feet and let him hang there. Listen, it it was a bloody, gruesome process. I wish I could bring us different news, but I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus that so many people don't want to preach about and don't want to talk about today. I'm thankful for the blood because it's the blood that is covering our sins today. If not for the blood, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. If it wasn't for the spotless blood of a lamb, Jesus Christ, we would be dead in our trespasses and sins today. So today, I am not ashamed to preach on the blood of Jesus. I hope you're not offended to hear a message on the blood of Jesus. This is about Jesus Christ covering our sins with his blood. And so I want to just be very clear this morning about this. Many times you see a very PG-rated version of, of this crucifixion. But uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's been a decade now. It doesn't seem like that. But Mel Gibson put out a movie called The Passion of the Christ, which took a lot of flack because of how gruesome it was. How many of you have seen that movie? Would you just slip your hand up? Thank you. Uh, it was rated R for the graphic blood and intense violence that was displayed on a man called Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and Mel Gibson probably did as good of a job as any in displaying what took place on that day and that, that time surrounding when Jesus would have been crucified or massacred on our behalf. You probably remember it wasn't rated PG. You probably remember it was criticized widely by all the, the major uh, critiquing people about, about all that, that it went, went with it. If you're like me, when you watched him suffer, you looked away and you asked yourself, why does it have to be this way? Why does it have to be so bloody? Why is it, does it have to be so hard to watch? Can you guys relate to that? Like, I, I, I just, I still remember, I saw it the first time with a group of pastors 
Because I was in this association down here at the theater, the, uh, down here at the mall, and I remember sitting there the first time, and I went, I just don't know that I can just watch this. I want to turn away, but I can't turn away. It, it's just right here in my face. It was so graphic. Why does it have to be so bloody? Why does it have to be so violent? And I answer that question and say, because it was bloody, and because it was violent. Listen, he's not, uh, Mel Gibson didn't do anything more than take a picture from the Gospels and say, this is what it probably looked like. The suffering of Jesus is giving significantly more attention than his birth. Two of the Gospels uh, dictate to us um, the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ. Four of the Gospels dictate to us the resurrection. And, and the reality is a third of the Gospels is taken up with, the, with teaching us about what the suffering of Jesus looked like. This is right in our face. You know, we love Christmas. Who wouldn't like a newborn baby being born in a manger, right? And singing away in a manger or, or singing silent night, holy night. Who wouldn't love that? Who wouldn't love the story that a man was raised from death to life? We celebrate Easter, right? That's exciting. Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. And so we celebrate that. We can get behind that. Let me tell you where some people can't get behind this morning. That he was massacred and tortured leading up to the cross. We don't want to talk about that. That gets bloody. That gets messy. But to listen, this is the real story. This is how it really went down. To fully understand this story, I, I want us to walk through it. It's not going to be easy. You're not going to want to see some of the things that you see or hear some of the things that you hear today. I want to just go ahead and tell you right up front, it's going to be right in your face this morning because I believe that's how the Gospels display it. And I don't believe we can candy coat it or sugar coat it any other way than how the Gospels put it, which is that Jesus was massacred for us. And for us to really get and experience this story, we have, to, we have to look at this. And so we go to the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22, verse 44. We get our first glimpse of blood. And the Bible tells us, as Luke is writing, he is a doctor. And so he's writing this out. I find it unique. Well, not unique, but it, it, it makes sense that Luke would be writing this as a doctor. He says, being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, talking about Jesus, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, I want you to get this. He was just so intensely in prayer and in the moment of what was about to take place that his sweat became as drops of blood. Now, there is a medical explanation for this. It's a, a word I may not pronounce it exactly right, hematidrosis. It's a severe anxiety that would cause release of chemicals that would break down the capillaries in the sweat glands. And as a result, there would be a small amount of bleeding that would come out of these glands. And the reason that this might be important to the story is that, you know, the story of Jesus is super bloody. And the reason is because what this would do is break down those capillaries all throughout the body and it would cause the body to even bleed more as a result of having this syndrome. And so many times we think of the story of, of, of Jesus, you know, you know, the Jews would have said he would have had to have 39 lashes. But that's not necessarily the case for the Romans. You see, a Roman scourging would have been much more in, uh, grave than that. In fact, they probably would not have stopped beating Jesus until he was within a last gasp of his breath. He was hanging on for his life at this point. I mean, he was being beaten beyond recognition, almost to a point that his body could not even contain it all. The soldiers, they would have used a whip of braided leather with metal balls woven into the end of it. They would strike the flesh. These balls would cause deep bruises. And after enough blows, they would break open. They would have, these whip would also have pieces of sharp bone that would cut the skin severely. And the objective of the soldiers was not to lash out quickly and cause whips. It was actually to let it stay and then pull it and let it rip the flesh off of the person's back that they were beating. All the way down their back, their buttocks to their legs. Eventually, in many cases, parts of the spine would literally fall, uh, parts of the skin would be exposing the spine as, as, as bad as he was being beat. I want to just show you a two-minute clip from the Passion of the Christ just so we can get our mind back around this. I want us, I want us to really experience this. So would you guys show this, this two-minute video?
to think that Jesus was beaten beyond recognition in such a violent way. To, to think that he did that for each one of us is even more humbling. A third century historian by the name of Eusebius describes the flogging by saying a sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles and bowels or intestines of the victim were often open to exposure. Historians would have said that as many as six out of ten men that would have been beaten like this would have, would have died. That's how bad they were beaten, beyond recognition. But the torture doesn't stop just with the beating. I mean, you know the story. We saw the picture. They took a, a branch, a thorny branch, and weaved it down into this mock crown and shoved it on his head where the blood would have poured down his face and matted in his hair and probably filled his body just as it poured out. You know, the flogging and the scourging of Jesus was ordered, but the mockery was not. I don't know, I didn't get to the clip, the part of the clip in this, this segment where they were making fun of Jesus. They were yelling, hell, king of the Jews, ha, 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 while they're beating him. While they're massacring him. Well, they shoved a crown of thorns on his head. And then it gets to the point in the story, and the movie depicts it so well. I was, I was hurt. I was saddened by what I watched. And then it gets to the point of the movie where the guy spits in Jesus' face. And my, my hurt and my sorrow turned to anger. I don't know if you guys can remember this, this part of the movie. I got angry. Because I've often said, you can, you can beat me up. You can hit me, but just don't spit at me. They spit at Jesus. This the mockery of pouring it on and on, and you say, why? And that's the question I want to ask today. Why the torture? That question is nearly always asked when we see unjustified punishment or suffering on behalf of someone else. We, we, we have to say, why? What is the reason that you did this? I mean, I understand that you, you beat him and why you would have beat him, but why did you mock him and why did you, why did you do this to him? Why did you torture him like this? You know, because Jesus, and why did Jesus allow himself to be done like this? We know the answer because for us. He did it for us. But you know, Jesus could have tapped out. He could have said, listen, I'm done. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm the son of God. I have all authority to say, I am done. I'm not going to endure this anymore. He didn't do that. I, I remember the story. Um, I watched, uh, I've watched this, this video on this, I think it was on the Discovery Channel, of Navy SEAL training. As the people go to try to be Navy SEALs, you guys ever watch that? And they put them through this intense, I mean, this intense week that is just, or maybe it's two weeks, and they just about kill them. I mean, they do everything. They're voluntarily going through this because they want to be a Navy SEAL. And the training is so intense that they consume over 7,000 calories a day and still lose weight during it. They sleep about four hours during a whole week. But at any time in their training process, they can walk over to a bell that's in a central location and they can ring the bell and they can tap out. They can say, I don't want to do this anymore. I'll just go back to being a regular Navy guy. So oftentimes people say, the infliction I volunteered for is just too much. I'll tap out. And Jesus had the opportunity, but Jesus didn't tap out. Jesus didn't ring the bell. And I, I'm like, at some point in this story, I'm like, what about God? Like, why didn't God intervene? Tell you why God didn't intervene, because he loved you and I so much that the only way that we could be in right standing with God was through his son Jesus being crucified, being beaten, his blood being poured out for each one of us. I mean, why wouldn't he step in? Why wouldn't he stop it? So we have to ask ourselves why. And I, I, I want to get to our text this morning. In, in Acts chapter 3, I want us to look at this, 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 this story. And starting in verse 13, uh, 12, let's start in verse 12 of Acts chapter 3. Would you just stand to honor the reading of God's word? We, we're asking this question, why? Why all this? And I've set the stage, I've kind of put, you know, set the table this morning with this story, this picture, us, us experiencing this. But then we have to say, why did this happen? And I think we get the answer here. When Peter is preaching, they've just healed a lame man, him and John, at the entrance to the temple that was begging for money. And verse 12 says, So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. They, oh, these people were greatly amazed in verse 11. He, so it says, When Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? 
Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? He says this, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. Here's where it gets to the meat of our message this morning. Whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead of which we are all witnesses. Verse 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And then Peter says, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You may be seated and may God bless the reading of his word. So we look at this. Romans are faced with this ultimate question. What will we do with Jesus? Their their answer is to crucify him and torture him and beat him beyond all recognition. And so our, our main point for this message is why did they do it? Here's the answer, I believe. Ignorance. Ignorance. Peter says, you did this out of ignorance here. I believe it's in verse 17. I understand you did this out of ignorance. In other words, you didn't know what you were doing. You didn't know this was truly the Son of God. You had been told, you just didn't believe it. You didn't know it. And so they did not know what they were doing. They did not know what they were doing. Ignorance is a favorite defense defense of ours, isn't it? We can plead ignorance in anything. We figure we can't be held accountable for what it is that we didn't know. Right? So we'll make up all the excuses. I remember as a kid, my mom might ask me, did you take the trash out? I'd say, well, I didn't know it was trash day. Well, trash day is the same day every week, son. Well, I know, but I just didn't know it was today, right? Or you may, um, you may be late for a meeting, and, or not, and, and instead of saying, listen, I was late, something come up, you say, I just didn't know we had a meeting. Well, we have that meeting every week, you know? It's something you should make. Or how about this one? We could probably all relate. You get pulled over by the police officer. He says, you know why I pulled you over? No, nope, sure don't, sir. Right? And, 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 and you say, well, I pull, he said, I pulled you over for speeding. You say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know the speed limit. Well, he says, well, you passed three signs in the past mile that said, here's the speed. Or like me, I got pulled over Friday up in, up in Jacksonville, and the guy pulled me. He said, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, no, sir, I don't. I was being honest. He said, well, your tag is expired. I said, well, sir, I paid that in October. He said, well, you don't have a sticker on your, on your, on your, on your tag. I was like, oh, well, maybe somebody stole it. I get my tag receipt out. I show him where I paid it. But, you know, it's my responsibility to look at that tag to make sure that sticker's on there. If somebody stole it, I should be trying to catch that, right? We we plead ignorance in all ways. I'd kind of like to ask the Roman soldiers, did you know that you were beating the Son of God? Did you know that the blood that is spattered upon your face and your body was payment for your sin? Did you know that? Did you know that the bruises you gave him are for your transgressions, as Isaiah 53 says, which we taught in Sunday school this morning, that by his wounds you have been healed? Roman soldier, do you know this? And I'm quite confident their answer would have been, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know this. I didn't believe this. I didn't know this was true. And ignorance is the main reason I believe Jesus was tortured to the point that he was. They, they didn't know. They didn't believe. They thought he was just some Jewish carpenter who was causing them problems. How could they have known they were torturing the person who knit them together in their mother's womb? You know, somebody had probably told them, but they didn't get it. And sometimes ignorance is bliss, isn't it? It's like, you know, if I'm just ignorant of the fact, then it's okay with me. I remember when I was born, I don't think I've ever told this story, but when I was born, I didn't know this at the time, but my mom uh, told me later in life that my, my left foot was turned in. It was, a, it was all the way almost facing my other foot. And so when I was born, my mom and dad had to take me to the doctor, and they put a brace in between my legs. Okay, and, and I had to sleep with it and, and keep it on for so many, you know, months or whatever to try to get my left foot to turn out. For the longest time in my life, I had no idea this even happened. You know, you know, let me tell you how I found out. I was at my grandmother's house, and she got out the photo albums one day. That's under her coffee table. And we would pull those out, and, and Deesa's here. She's my cousin. We'd often get those out and look at them. We enjoyed that. And so we'd pull, flip through the picture and say, who is this, and who is this, and what are we doing here? And there's this one picture that she has of me of a baby bed with a brace in between my feet. And I began to go to my mom, and I said, what in the world was wrong with me? I was about 8 or 9, 10 years old. I don't know. What was wrong with me? See, I was ignorant to that fact until about 8, 9, 10 years old. 
And then I began to realize from that point forward, I can't look at my feet and go, you know what, I had a problem. I had a problem. That left foot doesn't do what it's supposed to do. You can look at it now, you say, hey, it looks great. But if you let me kick back on a recliner and prop my feet up, my left foot is going to do this and my right foot is going to stay straight. And I can't even sit in the recliner, recliner without looking at my feet and going, that foot's got problems. <laughs> but for 10 years of my life, I had no idea that foot had problems until somebody told me. Right? Sometimes we prefer to remain ignorant to our conditions. It's just easier for us. But if it comes to our relationship with God, listen to me. Maybe you're here and you're checking out Jesus. You're checking out the church. Listen to me. You cannot remain ignorant to the fact of your sin and the gospel. It's not going to do you any good. You can't plead ignorance in spiritual things. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus and it's easy to say, well, I didn't know. But that's not going to help you in the end. Sometimes... Ignorance leads to regret. You guys ever done that? Like, uh, I remember one time, and I hate to admit this, but I did this. Uh, I walked up to this lady at church, and I didn't know her. I was introducing myself. They were a guest. I was a youth minister at a church, and I said, Oh, when are you having a baby? She said, I'm not having a baby. Man, I wish I'd have known that before I opened my big mouth. Right? Right? I mean, sometimes ignorance leads to regret. The reality is some of us in our spiritual conditions, our ignorance is going to lead us to regret. You could stand before a judge and you might have, you know, somebody might have been a drunk driver. They might have hit somebody in the other lane because they crossed away and they said, but I just didn't know I was in the other lane. Ignorance does not help you. It's still what happened. You still have to pay the consequences. While ignorance can be an explanation, ignorance is definitely not an excuse. If you ask a lawyer, about ignorance being allowed in court. It's not a legitimate excuse. It does you no good. There's some pretty crazy laws in Alabama. You guys ever looked at the law books? I'm ignorant to a lot of laws in Alabama. I just want you guys to know that. I did a little research. Did you know that in the state of Alabama, it is illegal to wrestle a bear? It's illegal. I didn't know that. And so just in case you guys were thinking about starting up a business, you know, of having bear wrestling on the side, you can't do that. So you're not ignorant of that anymore, okay? There's several others. I was, I was laughing at this. It is illegal to sell peanuts in Lee County after sundown on Wednesday. Now, I have no idea, but if you want to do that, that's illegal. That's, don't be ignorant of the law. Putting salt on a railroad track may be punishable by death. Did you guys know that? That's pretty severe crime. So do not go pour your, your, you know, your uh, iodized salt on the railroad tracks. That would be bad. Um, how about this one? It is illegal to wear a fake mustache that causes laughter in church. So in case you guys are thinking about that, don't try it. it you can't plead ignorance. How about this one? It is, it, it, is legal, oh, it is illegal for a driver to be blindfolded while operating a vehicle. How many of you are glad about that? Okay. So just in case you are ignorant of that law, don't get in your car blindfolded and drive. All right. It is legal. How about this? It is legal to drive the wrong way down a one-way street if you have a lantern attached to the front of your automobile. So if you want to drive the wrong way down a one-way street, put a lantern on the front of your car. All right? Listen, you can't claim ignorance on these anymore. And listen, after this message, I want you to understand, you cannot claim ignorance with your responsibility to God for your sin. The truth of the matter is that somebody has to pay the consequence for your sin today. Come close. Look me in the eye. It'll either be you or it will be Jesus. You can trust Jesus to pay the penalty for your sin, which he did upon the cross, and as you've witnessed on screen today, that he was buried and he rose again on the third day. Either that has to happen or you have to pay for it in eternal life, separated from God, in hell, which was created for the devil and his demons and not even for you. There's no middle ground. This is the truth of the gospel which I come to you to proclaim today. It is our responsibility to seek out God's Word in the Bible to know His truth and His standard of living and how we can find forgiveness of our sins. And so I want to break this down really simply in conclusion with three simple statements that I believe will revolutionize your life if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never trusted Him and followed Him. Here it is, letter A. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. Your sin put put Jesus on the cross. Go with me back to Acts chapter 3. And I want to start in verse 13. It, it, they're, they're talking here and they say, 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, check this out, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you and killed the prince of life whom God had raised from the dead, of which we are all witnesses. Who put Jesus on the cross according to Peter's sermon? You and I put Jesus on the cross. These Roman soldiers, yes, these, these, this, this crowd, yes, we find ourselves in this crowd. It is because of our sin that he is being killed all the day long, as we've studied this morning in Sunday school. He's been led as a lamb unto slaughter. It is by his stripes that we can be healed. Listen, our sin put Jesus on the cross. All the torture and all the pain was endured for our sake. Scripture is clear throughout that Jesus came to this earth because of our sin. He came with one purpose, to redeem mankind from their sin and restore us unto God. That is what he came for. My sin put Jesus on the cross. Your sin put Jesus upon the cross. I like a song that was sung. I used to sing it back in the late 80s and early 90s. It was a song that said this, Does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Have I crucified you, Jesus, with my sin? Am I causing you pain? Then I've got to change. I just can't bear the thought of hurting him. Folks, what we just witnessed is a result of our actions. I can't break it down any more simple than that. In Adam and Eve's case, they were righteous before God in the garden until they took of the fruit that they were not to take of. They committed a sin, and as a result, all of us have sinned. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in Romans chapter 6, Verses 23, it says, for the wages of our sin is death. Listen, we put Jesus on the cross. Say this with me. My sin put Jesus on the cross. Say that with me. My sin put Jesus on the cross. Say this with me. I am guilty. I am guilty. Listen, that doesn't sound too good, does it? That hurts to say that. But the reality is, it's our sin that put Jesus on the cross. And I'm sure there's probably some of you out here that could plead ignorance. Or if you can't plead ignorance, you could still choose to do it anyways because that's the way we do in life. It's like, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, God knows whether you know or not. He knows that. And some of you may have a real reason. You may have come in here and you wasn't raised in the church. You didn't know about Jesus. Your first song that you sung as a child was not, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I understand that. Okay, and I'm sorry that maybe you've come to this point in your life. I, I, I hurt for you that maybe you're at this point in your life and you've never truly understood the gospel message of Jesus, that you put Jesus upon the cross and that Jesus did that for you. And, and I'm sorry that we come to a point like this. I'm sorry that, that you wasn't raised in vacation Bible school like me and that Christmas and Easter was just something you did with your family to get together and have some food and it really didn't have any impact in your life and that no one ever explained to you the links and the depths and the love of Christ has for you. That troubles me and I hurt for that. You didn't realize that Jesus' blood was spilled out for your lying and your, and your pride and your greed and your lust. You didn't know Listen, ignorance is not going to be excused in the time of judgment. You're going to, God's going to look at you and say, listen, I, I, I've, you've, you've had plenty of opportunities. The book of Romans says even creation testifies to us that there's a God and shows us that we should be asking some questions. Listen, and you'll, 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 you've passed by church sign and you've been in maybe church services or you've been around people in your work or people in your neighborhood who've tried to tell you about Jesus, but you just keep putting it, playing ignorant. Your sin put Jesus on the cross, but let her be. Your sin will send you to hell. I want to be very clear this morning. There is not some holding place you're going to go to and hope somebody prays or gives enough money to get you out of there. The reality is, the Bible tells us to be absent from the body for the believers to be present with the Lord. And, and listen, if you look, for those of us who deny Jesus, he says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. The reality is, you're going to heaven or you're going to hell, and there is no middle ground. 
And so if you say, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, then the reality is you're probably pretty sure you're going to hell. And I know it's not a popular subject to preach on, but that's okay because Jesus had a whole lot to say about it. A whole lot. Listen, hell is a real place. Real people are going there. Uh, Jesus said that broad is the path that leads to destruction. There are many that go there by it. Many people are going there. Hell's a bad place. Some of you, I've, I've said this phrase over and over, or this, these, this kind of point, but, but the reality is hell's a bad place. There's a lot of bad things going to be happening in hell. And, and you've heard them all probably, or many of them. You've heard about the unquenchable fire. You've heard about the torture. You've heard about the eternal darkness and the feeling that you're falling forever. You've heard about the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. You've heard about it being the ultimate punishment for rejecting the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You understand it's going to be a bad place. But the worst part about hell, listen to me, come close, is God's not going to be there. No presence of God will be in that place. None. Can you guys imagine what that would be like? That I believe earth's a pretty bad place at times, our world. What we've made it is a pretty bad place. But the presence of God is here. How do we know that? Because he's in, he lives inside of each one of us in the form of the Holy Spirit. That he, he is here. He is in our presence today. Can you imagine going to hell where there is no influence of God whatsoever? Can you imagine how bad of a place that would be? But listen, the reality of the gospel is that this truth that I'm teaching you about, that your sin put Jesus on the cross and your sin will send you to hell, is not the end of the story? There's more. There's a way of escape. There's a way of salvation. The Bible says, let's look at verse th- uh, letter C. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Listen, for the, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we just read it, for the wages of sin is death. But that verse doesn't end there as we talked about last week. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The gift of God. What, what gift are we talking about? This gift of Jesus. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse uh, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The gift of God is Jesus. He has given us Jesus. This Jesus who was beaten at a post and put on a cross and and killed and then raised up on the third day. This is God's gift. And Peter looks at these guys in verse 19. He gives them the greatest advice he could ever give them. And I give you the same advice that, that Peter's sermon was in verse 19. Look at it with me. He says this. Repent therefore. In light of what I've just told you. You have to look at therefore. You have to go back and see what it's there for in the Bible. And here's what it here's what it's there for. You have put Jesus on the cross. You have denied him. You, you, you. You hear Peter saying that? He says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Oh, listen, this is the good news. The good news is that that no matter what you're in, no matter where you've been, no matter how much sin is in your life this morning, you can repent therefore and your sins be blotted out. Listen, you can repent. What does that mean? To turn away from the life you are now living and turn toward Jesus Christ and embrace Him and Him only. Listen, you can turn away from your sin and turn toward Jesus, and the God of this universe will come into your life and save you through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the message of the gospel. This is the good news that I could come to offer to you, that your sins will be blotted out. No matter what you've done, blotted out with the blood of Jesus Christ, it will be covered. What would it be like? I mean, I like what uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and do what? Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All of it. Everything you've ever done, wiped white as snow with the blood of Jesus. I believe if the Roman soldiers would have known who Jesus was and not ignorant of that fact, they would have stopped immediately. We know that now we know who Jesus is and he endured it for us, so how can we continue to live in the same way in light of knowing this? So I encourage you, repent, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away or blotted away out maybe you're like the roman soldiers and the the romans of the day who tortured jesus maybe you just you've been unmoved in your life by the suffering of jesus maybe it really hasn't had an impact on your life i want you to understand how 
th- 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 this, this story that I'm giving you today from God's Word is very clearly the only way that you can be saved. Are you with me this morning? The only way you can be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. We need to be moved by this. Listen, does this story transform you or just inform you? Because we're so busy looking at stuff as like this, okay, this is knowledge to me. This is history. Listen, this is not just a historical event for Brad Williams. This is a life-transforming event that will forever change me and my eternity. What about you this morning? I want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. I don't know what your background is for most of you this morning, or many of you. Here's what I do know. I believe God has given me a word this morning to proclaim his gospel message to those who have been ignorant of what Jesus has done for them. Maybe you lived in the South or the Bible Belt your whole life, but you've never really understood what it means for Jesus to die for you until today. Then listen, this message has been for you. This message has been for you. Many of us in this room have been right where you're at when the gospel all of a sudden makes sense to us. Some of us were young, some of us were middle-aged, some of us were older folks, but the reality is many of us, all of us who are believers in here, have come to an understanding of the gospel at some point in our life, and it just clicked. We said, that's what I've been looking for, and that's what I need. So I ask you this morning, what about you? Is that what you've been looking for? I was eight when I realized that's what I was looking for. My wife, she was 21 when she realized that's what she was looking for. So I don't know what it is you need this morning. But if you need the gospel, if you need to be transformed by the blood of Jesus.